G'day, my name's Harry Lamb, and I'm here today to talk to you about on-farm nanopore sequencing for genomic breeding values in livestock. So genomic selection is the use of genomic information to, to inform selection decisions. Traditionally, phenotype has been used in agriculture to select superior animals, but in the early 2000s, a method to incorporate genomic information was developed. Traditional genomic selection in agriculture uses a SNP chip micro, micro array to genotype a number of loci spread evenly throughout the genome. We then, use a hap, we then use a library of haplotypes to infer missing genotypes in a method known as imputation, and this leverages the power of existing data sets. Next, uh, we use a reference population with known phenotypes and genotypes to establish correlations between our desirable traits and genotypes. Finally, we use best linear unbi unbiased prediction to actually calculate genomic estimated breeding values, which are a value that links uh, a genotype to a desirable trait. So the benefits of genomic selection are that we can predict traits that are difficult to phenotypically measure. So for example, in the beef industry, this might be eye muscle area or intramuscular fat content. And the second benefit is that genotype can be measured from the day of birth. So rather than waiting for an animal to mature and observing a phenotype, we can actually predict that phenotype from the day that animal is born. So ultimately, this means that genomic selection leads to accelerated genetic gain. And this has already been demonstrated in both the dairy industry and the poultry industry. A traditional SNP array pipeline looks something like this, where at day zero, uh, a herd is mustered or yarded and hair samples are taken and then posted to a lab. Those samples then arrive in a lab and analysis begins. And then after three to four weeks, our genotype results are ready. These genotype results are then uploaded to a database such as BreedPlan, which has a bank of, those, of the reference population with known phenotypes and genotypes, which allows us to then calculate our genomic estimated breeding values. After about six to eight weeks, those GBVs are ready, and then they're given back to the producer who can then yard their animals again and select animals according to GBVs. The problem is, however, that the Australian beef industry is broken up into a northern and southern industry. So the southern industry is characterized by smaller herds and smaller properties. And this means that animals in the southern industry are traditionally handled multiple times a year. This means that that SNP array pipeline is very well suited to the southern industry. On the other hand, the northern Australian beef industry is characterised by large herds and very large properties. To put it in perspective, some of Australia's larger cattle stations in the north are actually the size of Israel. This means that animals in northern Australia are yarded in a very unique way where we actually use helicopters and aeroplanes to go out and find the animals and then a number of people on the ground on motorbikes or in cars to actually help bring those animals in. So the image you can see here is actually taken from a helicopter that's helping to yard about 1,500 animals with uh, a handful of motorbikes on the ground behind the mob. So this means that yarding animals in Northern Australia is extremely expensive and it's only done once a year. So this means that the traditional SNP array pipeline that I've sort of just elaborated on isn't well suited to the Northern beef industry. And this has hindered the adoption of genomic selection in the north. That's where our solution comes in. So our solution is to use Oxford nanopause minine to sequence cattle on farm at low coverage in order to estimate their genetic merit. The aim of this study was to investigate the feasibility of this on-farm sequencing method by simulating breeding values using low coverage nanopore error rates calculated from nanopore data generated here in our lab. To address this aim, we wanted to answer three key questions. The first was, what is the single nucleotide error rate of SNP genotyping? The second was, what is the likelihood of a particular base substitution given the nanopore sequencing errors? And then finally, how do these two error rates actually affect the calculation and accuracy of genomic breeding values? So to answer our first question, we randomly subsampled data from an animal that we'd sequenced on a minine down to four, six, eight, and 10 fold coverage. The bovine genome is deployed and it's approximately three gigabases in size. So this represents 12 to 13 gigs of sequence data. We then genotyped 50,000 loci that matched the Illumina 50K SNP chip 
using our own script, which incorporated a variable minimum allele count. The minimum allele cutoffs we used ensured at least a 95% probability of observing both genotypes given the coverage and sequencing error rate. We then compared our 50,000 nanopore genotypes to the 50,000 SNP chip genotypes for this animal, which we considered to be the true genotypes, and then calculated our accuracies. So you can see the accuracies here for the different coverages, and you can also see the percentage of positions which we didn't call. So these positions were positions with less than two-fold coverage. And at four-fold coverage, or um, our simulation of four-fold coverage, we saw about 40% of positions with less than um, two reads spanning them. We do see a plateau in accuracy at around 93 to 94%. And this was because our genotyping script assigned loci with more than two possible genotypes as an error, rather than discriminating between the true genotype and the sequencing error. Next, we looked at the likelihood of a particular base substitution given, given the sequencing errors. So for this, we took data from an animal we'd sequenced on a minine to about eightfold coverage. And this animal had also been sequenced on PacBio bio and Illumina platforms. And the PacBio and Illumina data had been used to create quite a high quality reference genome. So we aligned our uh, minine data to this reference genome. And then we generated a genome wide M pile up and observed the different uh, base mismatches. So overall, we observed a 2.7% single nucleotide uh, error rate, and this doesn't include indels or insertions. So this is just um, errors where errors of nucleotide substitutions. So for A and T reference positions, we saw a 0.5% uh, error rate, and for C and G positions, we saw about a 0.84% error rate. So here in these three graphs, you can actually see the breakdown of particular substitutions. So for example, in the top left, we uh, have the breakdown of substitutions for A loci. So A to G, A to C, or A to T. And you can see quite clearly that A to G substitutions were far more common than A to C or A to T. So next, we combined all of this information to actually look at how this was going to affect the accuracy of our genomic estimated breeding values. So to do this, we used a herd of 868 uh, heifers that have been genotyped on the Illumina SNP chip, Illumina 50K SNP chip. And then we predicted a trait called age of corpus luteum or age CL, which is an indicator of puberty in animals. We then compared, compared the accuracy of our uh, nanopore simulated genotypes uh, and the GBVs they produced to the known phenotype for that animal, which was recorded using ovarian scanning. But firstly, we calculated the accuracy of SNP chip GB, GBVs in this population. And accuracy of GBVs is a function of both heritability and the size of a reference population. So here you can see the accuracy of um, SNP chip GBVs is around 0.4. So this was the accuracy we were really trying to achieve in this simulation. So next we went into the um, genotype files and we simulated our nanopore Errors. So for example, here, if it was uh, fourfold coverage, we simulated 40% of um, the 50,000 positions as missing a genotype. And this is coded as a negative nine in the software that we were using. And then an additional 15% of positions, we simulated an error. So then we used the uh, nucleotide substitution rates that we calculated earlier to then actually make sure that the errors we were simulating really represented the um, characteristic errors of nanopore sequencing. So for example, for this A error uh, that's circled here for genotype three, we simulated a CG or T error using those percentages you can see there in the bottom right of your screen. Now, when we actually went through and simulated these nanopore uh, errors, we simulated two different scenarios. So the first scenario was, a, was the scenario where both the reference and validation population would be nanopore genotype. Now this is a, quite an unrealistic scenario because we already have hundreds of thousands of animals that have been SNP chip genotyped. So our second simulation was a scenario where just validation animals would be uh, nanopore genotyped and we would still use the more accurate SNP chip genotypes to establish our correlations between genotype and phenotype and then just predict, um, 
predict our GBVs in the validation population. So here you can see the GBV accuracies we were able to calculate for uh, the fourfold coverage simulation. And you can see that the validation only nanopore genotype population performed very well. And we actually got the same GBV accuracy as our SNP shift accuracy, which we were very surprised to see. Um, you do see, however, that the reference and validation scenario, when they're both nanopore genotyped, the accuracy is much, much lower. This is to be expected because uh, the lower the accuracy of genotyping in your reference population, the um, worse the actual correlation we can get between the genotype and the phenotype. As you could expect, as we increase our coverage and um, the accuracy of our genotyping increases, the accuracy of our GBVs also increase. So you see here that at about eightfold coverage, we get the same uh, GBV accuracies in both our simulations here. So this was very promising to see, and this means that we're going to continue taking forward um, this particular sort of area of research. And the next thing we're looking at, and, and what I'm actually doing right now, is calculating predictions for a number of different traits, both uh, lowly heritable and highly heritable traits, uh, in 40 different animals at um, one-fold and two-fold coverage. So we're hoping at one-fold coverage we can actually use imputation enough to still get accurate GBVs. And this would mean that um, once we then incorporate adaptive sequencing to target the QTLs, we hopefully can calculate um, accurate GBV, GBVs from uh, that one-fold coverage and then multiplex a number of animals on a single flow cell. Once we can multiplex a number of animals on a flow cell, this would make uh, this sort of pipeline actually economically feasible for a producer. Another thing we're really... Um, hoping to also incorporate into this pipeline is um, actually using methylation data. So methylation signals to predict the age of an animal and also um, predict the ossification. So ossification is sort of the premature aging of an animal and it impacts the price uh, that consumers are willing to pay for beef. So if we can incorporate methylation to predict premature ossification, we can then um, actually sort of realize some more some increased returns using this methylation information. So to finish off, I just want to thank my supervisors, Elizabeth Ross and Ben Hayes. I also really want to thank Lone and Bailey. So Lone's done all the sequencing and so far sequenced about 100 animals on the minine and Bailey um, was fantastic with helping with the actual predictions. I also want to thank Quaffy and our everyone in our lab, as well as Meat and Livestock Australia for their um, funding and support, and then Northern Genomics um, Project collaborators, so any collaborators that have actually donated samples to this project, thank you very much.